We now return to the art of the game with Ty Valentine. What can be said about South Park that hasn't already been said? Prior to 2014, it would have been that they actually made a good game. The Stick of Truth is a fine example of an RPG that manages to stay faithful to its IP, while playing exceptionally well as a traditional loot and explore fantasy adventure. The classiness of its design is rivaled only by its emotionally gripping storytelling. Inspiringly written and immensely entertaining, this is Obsidian Entertainment's modern masterpiece, South Park, The Stick of Truth. Warning, this video game contains ableism, abortions, alcohol abuse, aliens, anal evacuation, anti-Semitism, bestiality, BDSM, bullying, Canadians, child abuse, drug abuse, explicit gore, flatulence, feces, homophobia, improper use of contraceptives, Nazism, pedophilia, poverty, rape, racism, religious topics, sexual intercourse, urine, vomit, vor, and vulgarity. Viewer and player discretion is advised. The South Park story began with a pair of short films released in the early 90s called The Spirit of Christmas. The first film, referred to as Jesus vs. Frosty, was made by Matt Stone and Trey Parker under the moniker of Avenging Conscience during their time at the University of Colorado. Animated with construction paper and shot with an 8mm camera, South Park's beginnings were humble. Four young boys, similar to the modern characters of Cartman, Stan, Kenny, and Kyle, awaken a snowman by placing a hat on it. The snowman, named Frosty quickly turns into an eldritch nightmare, who then kills Kenny, whose character looks like the modern Cartman. Oh my god! Frosty killed Kenny! Dude! The boys approach Santa Claus for help, but Santa is Frosty in disguise, and he kills another of the gang. At a nativity scene, the remaining two summon a very tiny Jesus Christ, who proceeds to kill Frosty, saving the day. The boys ponder the meaning of Christmas with an I Learned Something Today segment, concluding that it's all really about presents. The word fuck is spoken a total of nine times in the four minute long film. This structure was to remain the template for almost all future South Park episodes, with the gang getting into trouble, saving the day, and learning something, all the while swearing like sailors and generally being dicks to each other. Stone and Parker's second film, Jesus vs. Santa, released three years later in 1995, made with better quality construction paper. The foundations for their show were starting to form. Debuting on August 13th, 1995, 1997, South Park aired on Comedy Central to decent ratings. Since then, it has risen to become one of the most popular animated shows, spawning a critically acclaimed feature-length film and nine video games. Over the course of the 319 episodes so far, South Park has been primarily focused on cultural satire and commentary, mixed with shock humor and vulgarity. Controversy has followed the series closely throughout its lifetime, as nearly every beloved religious, political, ideological, and cultural figure has been made fun of. The narrative never leans either conservative or liberal because everything and everyone is a target for mockery. Its appeal to children in being colorfully animated conflicts with the mature themes of the episodes. This adds to the problems parents have had in keeping their kids from watching it. South Park is not designed for children, but it certainly looks the part. There's a love it or hate it dynamic when it comes to people's opinions of the show. If you enjoy popular people or trends being creatively roasted, I'd recommend it. It's extreme gross outs, intentional offensiveness, and constant immaturity belie thoughtful critiques on a variety of topics. The Stick of Truth doesn't stray from the series in these regards. Obsidian Entertainment, the studio behind Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic 2 and Fallout New Vegas. Yeah that Obsidian, developed the Stick of Truth. Stone and Parker approached Obsidian in 2009 with the idea. They wanted the game to retain the look of the show, and keeping in line with tradition, Matt and Trey would write the script. Due to the lackluster reviews of previous South Park games, Stone and Parker wanted to be directly involved with the development of TSOT. Their company, South Park Digital Studios, was the first financier of the game because they knew any respectable publisher would try to water down the content for the sake of marketability. Originally, THQ stepped up as the publishers in 2011. Unfortunately, a year later, they filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy after failing to release several products. During a turbulent auction of THQ's assets, Matt and Trey sued to keep the publishing rights to their game. Their efforts failed, and Ubisoft bought them for $3.2 million. 
The three studios worked together for another six months, cutting some content that would have pushed the budget too far for Ubisoft. Finally, in March 2014, after four years of development, The Stick of Truth was released for PS3, Xbox 360, and PC. If the game seems like one of those early 2000s Flash games from Newgrounds.com, that's because essentially it is. Obsidian used Adobe Flash to produce and animate the visual assets. Skyrim served primarily as inspiration for the content of TSOT, in addition to Paper Mario, Earthbound, and The Legend of Zelda games. There's also heavy influence from the Lord of the Rings series. The story takes place in the fictional town of South Park, Colorado, where you, the new kid, have just moved into your new home with your parents. In the opening cutscene, we learn that the town is referred to as the Lands of Zaron by the children, in which the humans of Koopa Keep battle ferociously with the drow elves of Larnion for possession of the Stick of Truth. One of your goals throughout the game is to make as many Facebook friends as possible. You will meet characters who immediately befriend you, and others who won't because of your low number of friends. In that mechanic, we can already see some biting social commentary, being that social media clout is generally very shallow, but can act as a springboard to a whole host of lucrative opportunities. It's also an accurate portrayal of primary school culture. Oh, hey, Ty. Oh, hey, Jessica. So, I know I said I would go to the dance with you, but I think I'm gonna go with Brent instead. Oh, um, he is like friends with all my friends, and you're like not really friends with anybody. So, yeah, it'll just be a lot less awkward that way. Oh, uh, yeah, I guess, I guess I understand. Good, great, I'm glad you understand. Okay, bye. What the fuck? You can't change your character's gender. You will, however, be given plenty of hair, clothing, and makeup options to give yourself the appearance of being a girl. There's actually a good amount of customization you can do. Once you've created your character, the adventure begins. Your parents meet you in your bedroom, where they ask if you remember why your family moved to South Park. You are a silent protagonist, and thus don't answer your parents or anyone else's questions. In the tradition of a pre-COVID-19 world, your parents tell you to go outside and make friends. You quickly meet next door neighbor Butters after helping him fend off an attacker. Butters leads you to the kingdom of Koopa Keep, or KKK for short, where he introduces you to Grand Wizard Cartman, Warrior Clyde, Ranger Scott Malkinson, and Princess Kenny. Don't ask why Kenny wanted to be a chick, it's just how he seems to be rolling right now. Before starting your first quest, Cartman names you Douchebag, which you can't protest because you don't talk. After that, you're given a choice between four classes, Fighter, Mage, Thief, and Jew. Cartman brings you to the Stick of Truth, an all-powerful MacGuffin which allows its bearer control over the universe. Suddenly, the Drow Elves unleash a surprise attack on Koopa Keep, hoping to steal the Stick back. After single-handedly defeating the intruders, you learn that the Elves have escaped with the Stick of Truth. Warrior Clyde had failed to protect the relic, for which Cartman banishes him from space and time, a grisly fate. That was your one goddamn job, Clyde! To guard the Stick of fucking Truth! You are tasked with assembling Koopa Keep's three greatest warriors, Token, Tweak, and Craig, for which Butters accompanies you. After running errands to free Token and Tweak, the gang learns that Craig is imprisoned in after-school detention by Counselor Mackey. Cartman teaches you the power of the Dragon Shout, a magical close-range fart attack that can gross out enemies and create explosions from fires. He establishes that no matter what, one must never fart on another man's balls. Against all odds, after battling your way through the school, past the Ginger Hall monitors. You free Craig and the other children trapped by Mr. Mackey. Damn you, Craig! The army meets back at Koopa Keep, where Wizard King Cartman promotes you to Sir Douchebag. Through Carrier Raven, i.e. Twitter, it is revealed that the Stick of Truth is in the hands of the Bard, a level 10 drow elf with the power to influence the battlefield with song. Further honing your skills with magic, Cartman teaches you the Cup of Spell technique, a ranged fart attack that can be thrown over great distance. The army proceeds to the Inn of the Giggling Donkey, where the Bard is hiding out in possession of the stick. After making in contact, the bard Jimmy unleashes an ambush of elves on you and your companions. I am a level 10 bard, and with my loot, I shall power up my elven guards with magical songs of enchant. With magical songs of enchant. With magical songs of enchant. Mag 
Magic is done. The team handily defeats the ambush, and the bard flees to the top floor. In the midst of battle, Princess Kenny is captured and presumably raped by the elves. Bravely swooping in, you rescue the princess, who joins you in battle against the legendary bard. The humans are triumphant, and the stick of truth is returned to the kingdom of Koopa Keep. The sun sets on the land of Zaron, requiring you to return home to your parents and off to bed. You are suddenly awakened by an alien abduction. You've been selected for anal per Probing, a regular occurrence in the town of South Park. Your sphincter control proves too great for the alien's technology, breaking one of the anal probes off in your asshole, granting you the power to teleport using antennae scattered throughout the ship. Here you help free Randy Marsh, who befriends you on Facebook and escapes. Once the alien pilots are beaten, the spaceship crash lands in South Park. You awaken moments later, safely in bed, at the start of a new day. The local news channel shows the alien spacecraft surrounded by the military, who claims it to merely be a new Taco Bell under construction, effectively fooling the townspeople. Thanks, Midget, I do love me some Taco Bell. Wizard King Cartman arrives at your door, informing you that the Stick of Truth was stolen by the elves under the cover of night, which breaks the rules of the game. Counting on your exceptional ability to make friends, Cartman orders you invite the other various factions of Zaron to aid the army of Koopa Keep, starting with the Goth Kids. In Proving your worthiness to the goth kids, you must acquire coffee and cigarettes. Outside the coffee shop, a group of drow elves demands your presence before their king. Kyle, the high Jew elf king, informs you the theft of the Stick of Truth was Cartman's doing, in an effort to garner more support for the KKK. Kyle asks that you recruit the goth kids into their faction instead, so that they might return the stick to its rightful place in their kingdom. In your new quest, you are joined by Jimmy the Bard and Stan the Ranger. You appease the goth kids with coffee and cigarettes, but they are still not satisfied. Their next request before joining you is that you crash a PTA meeting and tape a sign saying fuck the conformists to the head table. The entire town is in attendance at the meeting in an uproar over Taco Bell's sudden takeover. The angry mob leaves, demanding action be taken. Randy Marsh confronts you before you get a chance to tape the sign up, but promises to help you if you infiltrate the alien crash site in an effort to get to the bottom of the conspiracy. Randy teaches you the stealthful art of the sneaky squeaker a magic technique that allows you to manipulate a fart into activating behind opponents, distracting them and allowing access to guarded areas. In one of the vent shafts at the crash site, you overhear a conversation between government agents who are discussing the effects of a mysterious liquid unleashed on the town when the alien ship landed. The goo turns any organic material into Nazi zombies. God damn it. I'm so tired of Nazi zombies. It's so overused. The solution proposed by big bad government guy wearing an eye patch is to blow up South Park under the guise of an earthquake. An audio recorder sitting on the table during the meeting records the conversation, which your character retrieves as evidence of the conspiracy. A full-on Nazi zombie outbreak has occurred while you were inside the military camp, creating a new type of enemy for your team to face. Returning the recorder to Randy and the PTA board, they listen to the recording, but from a late point where the fact that the alien toxin is Nazi zombifying people isn't covered. The adults are instead convinced that Taco Bell plans to blow up three city blocks and that nothing else is going on. Randy takes the picture the goth kids required of you in thanks for your help. Bearing an all-black outfit and a picture of the sign on the PTA table, your final test is of traditional goth song and dance. After demonstrating your prowess in lifting your feet while staring at the ground, all while smoking and drinking coffee, the goth kids are impressed enough to join your cause. The choice is now up to you whether to side with the humans or the elves, changing the storyline temporarily. I sided with the elves on my first playthrough, and as a result, headed an offensive on the school, where Grand Wizard Cartman's forces were rumored to be hiding the Stick of Truth. The gang makes their way through the school, eventually facing off against rivals Butters and Cartman. <laughs> After defeating your enemy faction, it is revealed that all parties were misled. They were both lured to the school by Craig, who has managed to raise an army of his own while the humans and elves fought amongst each other. Spurred on by revenge for Cartman's banishing him from time and space, Craig now possesses the Stick of Truth in his Tower of Darkness and intends to conquer the world 
with his newfound power. The gang heads to Craig's tower to confront him, but are thwarted by the inescapable power of bedtime. Once more, your character heads to bed, where again your rest is interrupted, this time by the Underpants Gnomes. Realizing you are a witness to their activity, the Underpants Gnomes decide to try and kill you. A Gnome Warlock shrinks you down to their size in an effort to even the odds, but to no avail. They beat a hasty retreat into your parents' bedroom, where you witness your parents having sex from the incredibly uncomfortable perspective of them now being gigantic. The Warlock concedes and grants you the power to shrink and grow at will, only moments before you are both crushed under your parents' tits and balls. Again, you awaken safe and normal-sized in your bed the next morning. With your newfound powers, you are allowed to enter spaces previously unreachable, opening up further exploration of South Park. The humans and elves gather to join forces against Craig and his army of darkness, whose reign of terror threatens the entire world. Their combined strength alone cannot hope to stand up to Craig, however, and you are faced with the impossible task of allying with the remaining factions. The pirates the Federation, and the girls. How? The girls are not gonna fucking play with us. Yeah, dude, we can't convince girls to do this. No, but maybe the new kid can. The new kid has a power we have yet to understand. He makes friends on Facebook faster than any we have seen. He is really good at getting Facebook friends, I'll give him that. Each faction, of course, has you perform tasks for them in exchange for their alliances. In the process of finding out for the girls whether or not one of them had an abortion, you disguise yourself as a girl and infiltrate the unplanned parenthood clinic. You make it to the records room, where Randy drops in, informing you that Taco Bell has been going through the abortion records as well. Before you can get answers, government agents storm the building. The Nazi zombie plague has spread to the clinic, and panic ensues. People suspected of being infected are killed, and in order to prove your humanity to the agents, you must perform an abortion on Randy, who is now disguised as a woman. This skill with abortions will come into play later on. Suddenly, you are swarmed by newly resurrected Nazi zombie aborted fetuses, which culminates into a climactic battle with a giant Nazi zombie aborted fetus. After safely returning to the Council of the Girls with the abortion records, you discover the records were all kept in French, and therefore must be translated by a Canadian. You acquire a passport allowing you access into Canada, a strange land inhabited by strange creatures, whose world resembles that of an 8-bit adventure map. You are directed to the secluded monks Terence and Philip, living in the forests of the Kingdom of Vancouver. They teach you the skill of Nagasaki, a monumental fart powerful enough to tear down walls. This power grants you access to the Minister of Montreal, the only person capable of translating the specific French dialect of the abortion records. After translating the records and returning to the girls, they join the new army of Zaron. A few errands and tasks later, and the Federation and pirates have joined forces with you as well. The army proceeds to Craig's house, where the final battle for the fate of the world begins. Near the top of the tower, Randy informs the team that Taco Bell was looking through the records at the abortion clinic, seeking a suitable candidate for a snook, a thermonuclear warhead detonated from inside women's vaginas. They learn that Mr. Slade, an openly gay man whore with a particularly loose asshole, has been tied up and had the snook forcibly inserted up his rectum by the government in their efforts to cover up the alien crash landing and subsequent Nazi zombie outbreak. Using the shrinking power granted to you by the underpants gnomes, you must travel up and into Mr. Slave's large intestines to defuse the snook before it detonates, destroying all of South Park. The snook's automatic detonation sequence can only be aborted by means of abortion. In Clyde's throne room, you face off against his most dangerous creation, Nazi Zombie Chef. You succeed in defeating both Chef and Clyde, and Grand Wizard Cartman names you King Douchebag in celebration. The victory is short-lived, however, as the big bad government guy swoops in and steals the Stick of Truth. He then reveals your true name of Dovahkiin. Prior to moving to South Park, you were a prodigal user of Facebook and had amassed 3.2 billion friends on the app. This had aroused the interests of the U.S. government, who wished to harness your raw talent for social media. Do you have any idea the power that kind of gift yields in today's world? It's time to come with us, Dovahkiin. Time to stop resisting and use your gift for your country. The gang informs Government Guy of the potential the Stick of Truth holds, and in a blind power trip, he derobes and proceeds to the top of Craig's Tower. Princess Kenny, seeing an opportunity to rise to power, sides with Government Guy and takes the stick for herself. Sensing her defeat, Princess Kenny drinks the green goo, transforming herself into Nazi zombie Princess Kenny. 
an unstoppable abomination with the power of invincibility. The only option that remains is to break the gentleman's oath and fart on Princess Kenny's balls. You unleash the Nagasaki, creating a powerful shock wave that cures the town's Nazi zombieism, returning everything to normal and saving the world. The gang decides that none shall wield the awesome power of the Stick of Truth and cast it into Stark's Pond. The boys ask what you want to play next, and in your only spoken moment of dialogue, you utter, Screw you guys, I'm going home. Wow, what a dick. A timeless tale, intricately woven with setups and payoffs, satisfying to even the most cynical storyteller. The effectiveness of the immersion in this world is helped by the decisions made regarding the gameplay. Combat is turn-based in a nod to old-school RPGs, with a two-person party limit for you and a six-party limit for the enemies. You eventually have a choice of six different party members you can swap at any time, each with unique special attacks and skills. You can issue commands to your buddies to unlock certain areas or heal various NPCs. When you've earned enough XP from completing quests, you level up, granting you a skill point to upgrade one of your special attacks. Each special attack has unique effects that can harm one or all of your enemies. The combat system is surprisingly deep. For example, once an enemy loses HP and falls on the battlefield, they are liable to be rezzed by another NPC unless you damage them enough to cause them to flee. That or you can explode certain enemies if you do enough damage, which is always a satisfying mechanic. You have a choice between light and heavy attacks, both of which are necessary to switch between depending on the enemy's defenses. The potency of your attacks is based on the timing of your button presses. You'll see glimmer on your weapons that alert you to the proper timing to attack, and a shield icon on your characters to alert you to press block. Special attacks are often QTEs that if you mess up can severely downgrade their effectiveness. I did my second playthrough as the Jew class and sided with the humans, which only mildly changed the overall experience. You all end up joining forces near the end anyways, so really it just changes a couple cutscenes. I'm not entirely sure if they were going for something meta with this, but there are situations where you're given a couple of choices that don't end up being consequential. The fact that they make a whole thing of it when the elves summon you to the elf king makes me think that they were aware of what they were doing. Either way, it's pretty funny. To me, there's little more confusing game design than giving the player the illusion of choice. In many RPGs, you'll be given a few dialogue options that don't end up changing the course of the conversation or the story at large. They just make the person you're talking to give you a different sentence in response. I'd rather be railroaded through a story than be duped into thinking I can change the events in any meaningful way. Stone and Parker can be pretty subtle in their humor and are longtime RPG fans, so I'm pretty confident the illusion of choice here is intentional. If you're an achievement hunter without much free time, definitely look up a guide because there are missable achievements as the in-game days progress. Various objects in the world can be broken or shot with your bow to get collectibles and access to hidden treasures. Your weapons and armor consist of everyday items like wooden swords and hockey pads. Originally, Obsidian designed the gear as more traditional full-length swords and staves, but Stone and Parker insisted they make all the equipment crappy, reinforcing the fact that you're playing pretend. I love this little component of the game. It serves the humor in that your enemies, including grown-ups, aliens, Nazi zombies, and soldiers, are all playing pretend along with you, according to the rules of the children's game. It's also entirely lore accurate to the show, because the adults of South Park are prone to believe everything they are told, including from children. When the boys tell government guy with eye patch that an ordinary stick contains the power to change the universe, and his reaction is to go crazy with power, this is a joke that makes sense with the established logic of the world. Oftentimes it's the kids who have better foresight and grasp of the issues than the adults. Unless you're consistently upgrading and changing equipment to higher levels, combat will prove challenging. On normal difficulty there weren't any situations where I got cheaply killed that couldn't be solved with different gear sets and tactics. The game doesn't hold your hand for very long, but it also doesn't Dark Souls you. You're given plenty of healing items as well as money to spend on upgrades or gear. As basic as they are, the environments contain charming little details and nods to the fans. I've always appreciated games based on movies and TV shows that allow you to explore their fictional settings like Goldeneye or The Simpsons Hit and Run. There's something very special about walking through a world that up until that point you had only fleshed out in your imagination. There are certain areas in the game displaying various memorabilia featured throughout the course of the show. The simplicity of the Adobe Flash graphics allows for much greater PC player accessibility, as the requirements to run the game are incredibly low. There aren't even any options to adjust graphics other than the resolution, windowed versus full screen, subtitles, and gamma. South Park's visual style is a particular brand of shitty that the animators at Obsidian admitted 
to having a difficult time reproducing. Due to Stone and Parker's insistence on graphical cohesion with the show, the devs needed to faithfully recreate all the different assets by hand. Not an easy task by any means, as it required studying the show frame by frame to get every dimension, effect, and color choice just right. This was an incredibly apt decision on Matt and Trey's part, because a full 3D rendered game would be pretty off-putting, considering some of the humor of the show comes from the shittiness of the animation. Matt and Trey performed most of the voice acting, along with the full supporting cast from the show. I wasn't able to find much information on the music. It seems like they used all the orchestral stings from the show, and had some new medieval fantasy music made specifically for the game. There's a fitting element in one of the songs where Cartman is part of the choir. Overall, the game sounds great. All the hits, farts, special attacks, and menu sounds are fitting. I wish I could tell you more, but that's about all there is to it. All in all, South Park The Stick of Truth is a great fantasy RPG disguised under poop jokes and bad animation. It's a game made with sincerity and love for the source material. Will South Park fans love it? Absolutely. Will RPG fans love it? Probably. Will people who don't like South Park enjoy it? Absolutely not. Why did I make this review of an eight-year-old game based on a controversial cartoon? I have no idea. What I do know is that it's important to keep a healthy sense of imagination. As adults, we tend to do our best to stay pessimistic and grounded because we think it keeps us from being naive. What we're really doing is robbing ourselves of enjoyment in our own little universes. Anyone can see that children make the most out of any scenario with just a little imagination. We as adults don't have to forgo that just because we gotta pay the bills. The more in touch with our inner child we are, the more joy we allow ourselves to feel. Your imagination, especially for the creative type, is one of your greatest assets. Thank you for joining me on this invigorating adventure. All said and done, I got about 30 hours out of the Stick of Truth, so for 40 bucks, it's well worth it. So play it. I think I've finally arrived on a catchphrase. Check this out. <clears throat> Keep being excellent and have a great evening. Eh? Yeah? I, I might keep that one. Okay, bye.